probably killed five or forty years ago. He's a man of peace. His name is Brian Keenan, and tonight he's been held hostage in the Middle East. The song is dedicated to him. It's called The Belfast Child. Brian Keenan, seized April the 11th, 1986, on the streets of Beirut, a hostage for 1,316 days. John McCarthy, seized April the 17th, 1986, on his way to Beirut Airport, a hostage for 1,310 days. Terry Waite, disappeared on January the 20th, 1987, in the southern suburbs of Beirut, a hostage for 1,022 days. Britain is not alone in suffering the emotional pain and the political humiliation of seeing its citizens seized and held hostage in Beirut. In the last five years, a dozen different countries have suffered the same fate. But in one striking respect, Britain is alone. For unique among all the countries who have become the victims of the kidnappers of Beirut, only Britain has failed to bring out a single hostage alive. Tonight, World in Action investigates the secret deals which have won freedom for other nations' hostages, and we disclose how Britain's refusal to negotiate has left three men imprisoned for a thousand nights in Beirut. The longest held hostage is Brian Keenan, a teacher of English at the American University in West Beirut. If Brian was dead, it would hurt Jess, but you would accept it and you would learn to live with that. But this is what, what I would class as a living death, because you just don't know. If Brian had done something wrong and was sentenced for four years, well, at least you could write to him, you could go and see him, and you would accept that four years. But we can't accept this four years nearly for nothing. Hornsey, North London, a cricket tournament to win publicity for the fate of another hostage, TV journalist John McCarthy. He disappeared in Beirut three and a half years ago. John's father, Pat, was told of his son's abduction by phone. I was so dehydrated with the shock that uh, before going upstairs to tell my wife, I had to have a glass of water, you know. Uh, the first period, I felt... Uh, perm uh, permanently in a state of stress and of course my wife uh, was ill as well and this this was the terrible thing and she worrying about him we, we talked about him every every minute of the day you know what's happening to John now and that sort of thing uh, as the years went by it sort of it, it has a sort of a deadening effect and so it's a more dead feeling you might say uh, say after the last say three years. Beirut is a city without a government. After 15 years of war, the city is run by a collection of armed militias, all vying for power. In the course of their struggle, they've revived one of the Middle East's oldest and most effective weapons of war, kidnap. Since 1983, more than 60 Westerners have been held hostage in Beirut, most of them by Hezbollah, the party of God, rallying point for the most radical Shiite Muslims. Sir Anthony Parsons was Britain's ambassador in Iran and Mrs Thatcher's senior advisor on foreign policy. What one has to realise is that in terms of the Beirut hostage holding, the actual captors themselves have no interest whatsoever in releasing their prisoners unless they're going to get something directly out of it, like large ransoms, like the release of their own people who are held by somebody else. They are holding them for a number of reasons. It gives them power, it gives them prestige, and above all, it gives them an insurance policy against other people attacking them. The families of the British hostages can only imagine the conditions in which they are being held. But this man knows at first hand. Roger Oak, a French photographer, was himself abducted by gunmen in Beirut in January 1987. They drove him deep into the Hezbollah stronghold in the southern suburbs of the city. There he was locked in a small, dark basement room. I could not stand up and I could not, when I was sleeping, I could not lie com completely because it was too small and very, very wet, very humid. And uh, no window, of course, no, no light, just a small candle uh, for two or three hours. You know, candle, it's 
very short. And it was, uh, uh, for me, it was the worst place. It was the first play, place, and it was the worst place. And, uh, uh, it was like a nightmare. Every night, his legs were chained together. After a futile attempt to escape, his legs were chained by day as well. He wore a blindfold, which he was ordered on pain of death to slip over his eyes if a guard ever entered his room. For weeks at a time, he was kept in solitary confinement. They used to come in the night and to awake me at the middle, in the middle of the night and just to put one gun off my head and tell me, we're going to kill you, we're going to shoot you now. Uh, tell us if you're a spy or not. You know, it's, it was a, a real game. And um, at the beginning, uh, it was very scary, but after a while, you say, OK, if they want to kill me, they can kill me. I can, I can do nothing. You know. After 300 days of captivity, Roger Oak was set free with another French hostage, Jean-Louis Normandin. Yeah, it was a good day, a beautiful day. I was very surprised. So many people at the airport and we have been welcomed like uh, heroes, you know, coming from another planet. Scenes like this have become familiar in France and other countries. For while the British hostages have endured their thousand nights of solitude, every other country has succeeded in releasing at least some of its hostages. The Russians, for example, fought fire with fire. On September 29, 1985, four of their Beirut embassy staff were kidnapped. One of the Russian hostages, Arkady Katakov, was found dead on this rubbish dump. The KGB soon identified the kidnappers and took action. They seized a group of the kidnappers' relatives and sent the genitals of one of them to the kidnappers with a message. It advised them that the remaining three hostages should be freed. The result, four Russians seized, one dead, three released. Even the Israelis, the most hated enemies of Hezbollah, have managed to do deals. First, they have made sweeping concessions to win freedom for their hostages. Three times they've released hundreds of enemy prisoners in exchange for a handful of Israelis. But then they have sent in their air force to inflict a bloody punishment on the kidnappers and their families. The result, 18 Israelis seized, possibly two dead, 15 released, one still detained. I hardly need to say that I'm glad to be here. The Americans have been loudest of all in condemning deals with terrorists but they secured the release of three hostages with the aid of Terry Waite by sending arms to Iran. An overseas entity, this controversial deal was to lead to the Iran-gate scandal and the downfall of Oliver North. The result, 14 Americans seized, three dead, three released, eight still detained. One of the most mysterious deals was conducted here in Germany. In January 1987, two prominent businessmen were kidnapped in the Lebanon. The German foreign minister dealt direct with Syria and Iran, applying diplomatic pressure. But in the background, the businessmen's companies, Herxt and Siemens, were to use more secretive tactics. They employed a shadowy figure who enjoys a reputation as a freelance spy and dirty trickster, Werner Maus. Werner Maus is a private agent. Uh, there are only very few pictures existing of him. Like this one, for instance, yeah, th which I um, received uh, recently. He was a former uh, um, man who sold vacuum cleaners. He also worked, for instance, in this horse club in Essen. And later on, he became uh, a member, civil member of the German police, you have to say. Maus flew to Damascus in Syria and had several meetings with his bowler. The last trip was to be the vital one and the most expensive. It cost the German companies, Herxt and Siemens, a reported $8 million. He received the money which was paid to the Hezbollah later on for the two hostages. And he took the money, complete suitcase of money with German uh, uh, marks in it, yes, put it in his private aircraft and flew down to Damascus. And as far as we know, uh, the money was given there to the Hezbollah people in the first case. The result, two Germans seized, none dead, Two released. In the face of intense public pressure, the French too were determined to deal. Between 1985 and 1987, France had 11 of its citizens kidnapped in Beirut, mostly diplomats and journalists like Roger Oak. 
Like the Germans, the French found middlemen to go into the hostage bazaar on their behalf. They used a secret service agent named Jean-Charles Macciani, who worked directly for the interior minister, and a Lebanese businessman named Iskandar Safar with contacts all over the Middle East. These two go-betweens dealt direct with Hezbollah's masters in Tehran over a period of 18 months. At the end of it, the French had restored diplomatic relations and repaid the best part of a billion dollars which they had borrowed from Iran and had been refusing to pay back. Closer to the bone, they expelled some of the Ayatollah Khomeini's political opponents from France. And most controversial, they persuaded Middle East businessmen to pay millions of dollars in cash direct to the kidnappers on their behalf. And the Iranians replied with hostage releases. The result, 11 French seized, one dead from natural causes, 10 released. In all, nine different countries using their different tactics have freed more than 40 hostages. But the British government refuses to copy any of them. From Downing Street, the line is clear. No deals with terrorists. The result, seven British seized, three dead, none released, four still detained. One of the central planks of the British government's no deals policy is their belief that if a country gives in to terrorists, more of its citizens will be taken hostage. But the evidence does not support this. The Americans have had five more hostages seized since they made their arms deal with Iran. The Germans have two more of their citizens missing in Beirut. But the Russians have had no more hostages seized. The Israelis have had no more hostages seized. Even the French, who negotiated the release of ten hostages, have had no more seized. But Britain has. In May of this year, former Battle of Britain pilot Jack Mann was grabbed in West Beirut. Brian Jenkins of the Rand Corporation in California has advised the last five American presidents on terrorism. In a special report for President Bush earlier this year, he wrote, It is absurd to argue that there are absolutely no circumstances in which a government might not acquiesce in some kind of deal to obtain the release of hostages. The policy has become dangerously rigid. Jenkins can see the merit of the deals that have been made, especially the French one. And let's look at the outcome. They have, whether I like the deal or not, brought their hostages home. And thus far, no more kidnappings have occurred. They are out of it, and the government has moved on to other things. Other governments that have adhered more closely to no concessions policies still confront a nagging, albeit low-level crisis that occasionally punctuates headlines at, at a higher level but cannot get on with other aspects of policy in the Middle East because the hostage issue remains always there as an obstacle. Now you tell me which one is right. And how does that attitude compare with what you know of the British attitude? The British have a no concessions policy and the British have been more faithful to that policy. And the British hostages are not home yet. The British policy of no deals has split the families of hostages like John McCarthy. Some believe that the Foreign Office has done everything possible to get them out, but others are more critical. They have made no progress on getting the hostages released, in John's case in three and a half years, and no progress on the other hostages at all. It hasn't stopped other hostages being taken, because one was taken this year, and it hasn't done anything to find out whether John's alive, who's holding him, what they want, um, who who they should approach. It's not made any progress at all, so I, I would have thought that made it patently obvious that it's not working. The Foreign Office dismiss such criticism. They say they are active in many different ways. Officials refuse to discuss details with us, but World in Action has looked behind the scenes at what the government has really been doing. We discovered a lot of formal diplomacy, but a worrying absence of direct action. Other countries, like France, appointed full-time crisis teams, usually headed by a minister and including security services and Middle East experts. They generally met every day until their hostages were freed. But we've discovered that no such crisis team exists in Britain. Within the Foreign Office, there is a small terrorism unit, but the entire department consists of only five civil servants. Only two of them deal with the hostages each day, and even then they work on it only part-time. 
World in Action has also established that initiatives which might have led to the release of the hostages without breaking the no deals policy have been squashed. We have been told of at least two occasions when moderates in West Beirut came up with their own scheme to turn the tables on the kidnappers. They offered to bribe the guards into defecting and bringing out the British hostages with them. All it would take, they said, was for the British government to guarantee a new life and a new identity for the guards in the West, and the hostages would be free. But the Foreign Office stalled, and nothing came of it. Twice, the SAS, who proved their skill in rescuing hostages at the Iranian embassy siege, have submitted detailed plans to bring out the British hostages. And twice, nothing came of them. Last year, in May, the Foreign Office was offered a chance to open talks with the kidnappers without any preconditions. Former war correspondent Lord Kilbracken is a member of the House of Lords and has long-standing links with the Kurdish people. In May 1988, he was contacted by this man, Jalil Talibani, leader of the Kurdish nationalist movement. Talibani had been approached in Damascus by Hezbollah. Talibani decided to reach the British Foreign Office through his old friend, Lord Kilbracken. He had once contacted me and said, would I be able to get a message to the government um, that um, the Hezbollah were interested in um, improving relations and, and freeing hostages. Uh, I said I would certainly do anything that I could. Lord Kilbracken took Talibani's message to the Foreign Office, but to his surprise, he was rebuffed. Well, I got the impression that if Hezbollah were to say, now we're going to re release the hostages for no apparent reason, that then the Foreign Office would be glad to arrange uh, pick up of the hostages and uh, transportation and so on. But they weren't prepared to take any initiative, and Talibani would have gone back there at his expense, and there was nothing to be lost, and every possibility of getting the hostages out. But they turned you down? They completely turned me down, yes. As We've established that on 37 different occasions, go-betweens have approached the Foreign Office and offered to help to negotiate the release of Terry Waite. The Foreign Office claims that it thoroughly investigated every approach and that none proved to be satisfactory. Unlike other countries, it has never gone out to find its own middleman. As a result, we've learned from Foreign Office sources, the British government has never positively identified the kidnappers of its three citizens. It has never discovered any of the locations in Beirut where they are being held. It has never verified a single demand for them. And it has never established whether any of the British hostages is even still alive. But the story doesn't end there. On one occasion at least, the British hostages appear to have come much closer to being released than has been officially disclosed. But, ironically, their brief chance of freedom was provided not by the British government, which had sought to help them, but by the Iranian government, which had condemned them to captivity. The first move was made in the spring of 1988. Lambeth Palace, home of the Archbishop of Canterbury, was the starting point for the new initiative. We had an approach from uh, Iran, um, suggesting that uh, progress might be made if uh, various things could happen. Um, most importantly, if there could be a parliamentary visit to Tehran as a, to explore ways in which relations between the two countries might be improved. The Iranian move was no aberration. It reflected the rise to power of more moderate factions led by the former speaker, Hashemi Rafsanjani. They wanted to have uh, normal diplomatic and therefore commercial relations uh, with Britain and with Western Europe. Um, and they wanted to uh, take steps toward bringing that about. And they wanted to get the hostage question um, off the agenda. The next six weeks saw the staging of an elaborate diplomatic ritual, carefully choreographed in London and Tehran, so that neither side could be accused by its supporters of making concessions to the enemy. First, John Little took an all-party delegation to Iran. The parliamentary visit went um, very well. The um, MPs who went were very satisfied with the way things had gone, and the Iranians uh, appeared to be satisfied and we met uh, people from various parts of the Iranian government on that visit. 
The next bargain encounter was an Iranian terrorist who'd been jailed in 1981 after a bomb he was priming exploded prematurely in central London. He was now released in May 1988. The Iranians chose to see this as a concession and a sign of British goodwill. Finally, Iranian diplomats travelled to London and successfully negotiated a deal. Each country agreed to pay compensation for damage done to the other's property by the SAS storming the Iranian embassy in London and by revolutionary guards sacking British property in Iran. Under the terms of the deal, the British agreed to pay the Iranians one million pounds. By the end of June, this diplomatic ritual was reaching a climax. In the terrorism unit in the Foreign Office, the wheels finally began to turn. Officials drew up detailed plans to handle the release of the British hostages, where to hold the press conference, whether to fly the relatives out to the Middle East or to stage the reunion in Europe. An urgent telex, ciphered for secrecy, was sent to every embassy in the Middle East, requesting an immediate report on available aircraft which could fly at short notice into Tehran to bring out the hostages. But then, disaster. On July the 3rd in the Gulf, a US battleship, the Vincennes, shot down an unarmed Iranian Airbus on a routine flight, killing 290. In London, Mrs. Thatcher intervened. She made a determined defense of the American action, saying she accepted the right of forces engaged in such hostilities to defend themselves. Iran was furious with the Americans and with Mrs. Thatcher's response. I remember thinking at the time that in view of the fact that it was a civilian airliner, in view of the fact that hundreds of people were killed in this uh, tragedy, that it would have been better simply to express deep regret uh, from the humanitarian point of view at what had happened and to have left it at that. The comments that she made um, put an end to any progress that might have been being made on the hostages' behalf. It put an end to uh, the improvement in our relationship with Iran. It was totally uncalled for. Um, and it, it was just so unhelpful. Let us pray for Terry, John McCarthy, and all hostages of whatever nation or creed. All seemed to be lost for the hostages. The Foreign Office denied that they were ever close to release at all, but our information is that the Iranians tried again, this time through the successful French negotiator, Iskandar Safar. According to well-informed sources in Paris, Safar worked all summer to put together a new deal. We're told it was to be a joint deal. All the Iranians wanted from the Americans was the return of their assets, which had been frozen in US bank accounts since 1979. From the British, they wanted normal diplomatic relations, and they wanted to buy two things, radar and railway technology. The Foreign Office insists it's never heard of such an arrangement, but by November 1988, Safa was telling associates in Paris that the deal was done. The British hostages would be home by Christmas. Then he started to complain that the two Western governments were stalling, apparently anxious that they would be accused of breaking the no-deals policy. By February 1988, they were still stalling when disaster struck again. The publication of Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, disrupted the new mood of cooperation between Iran and the West. Hardline elements in Tehran persuaded the dying Ayatollah Khomeini to sentence Rushdie to death. The West recoiled in anger. All deals were off. For the British hostages, the long wait for freedom drags on. For the families, it has been a thousand days of confusion and frustration. Do you know where John is being held? No, we don't know where John's being held. We've never known. No. No. And do you know for sure which individuals are actually responsible for his kidnapping? No. No? No. There's nobody has ever came forward and claimed Bran or said they had him. Do you know whether he's dead or alive? I reckon he's alive. We believe he's alive. Yes, I know. Bran will come home. I feel quite confident yeah. in that. Ten days ago, President Rafsanjani stressed that the death sentence still hung over Salman Rushdie. Rafsanjani then told the press that your governments are not so much interested in the question of hostages as you journalists. I recommend you to make the best effort in your countries to make your governments interested in the problems. I think if the policy continues, then it doesn't offer the hostages any hope at all. Um, it will result in them either, either being 
killed or all of them just staying there permanently. I don't think there's any possibility of them just being handed over. The people who are holding on to them have got too much invested in them after all this time to let them go for nothing. <laughs>